to your front porch. It's Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. Radio worth listening to. Brought to you each weekday from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Central Standard. All right, my friends, you can hear the music in the background. You can hear the intro, and that means that... Uh, here on uh, Reflections Radio, as well as Facebook Live, we are ready to go. Good to have uh, you as our student today. I do want to uh, encourage you to uh, uh, tell as many people as you possibly have. I know that we had several individuals advertising uh, for the uh, Bible study uh, each day, and we appreciate that very much. And so uh, I do want to remind you as well that this is Study Hall for the Brave the spiritual-minded Bible student. That means that we discuss dangerous things on this uh, uh, program. And uh, by dangerous, I mean that the truth is dangerous. It is dangerous to your old way of life. It is uh, dangerous to your old way of thinking. And it is dangerous to uh, all of the false philosophies of this world. So we want to warn you at the very outset that this is a Bible study that is designed for the brain. What I mean by that is that uh, you must have the moral fortitude and uh, the strong conviction to make a change in regards to accepting the truth. And so my name is Rick Popejoy. I'm your host. I have the distinct privilege of being here today, and I, am, I pray that you are prepared and poised and ready to study, to meditate, that's right, to reflect upon the precious book divine. Now today, specifically, is Open Mic Friday. That means that uh, uh, all of our Bible students, our listeners, uh, they get to determine the direction of the program. We still have uh, our topic of the week, which is the biblical doctrine of truth. And as such, the questions that uh, uh, are stimulated during the week are generally those that are brought about on our program uh, today. And so we're certainly glad uh, that you could be here. I see that we already have uh, uh, some students joining us. It's always hard on Facebook Live. I'm working on uh, trying to get an advertising system up, and uh, but I've just not figured that out yet. I'm sure that someone uh, out there can help me figure out how to advertise this a little bit beforehand and uh, I appreciate that so much. I see that uh, our good brother James Clark is with us. I see that uh, uh, and, and from San Angelo, Texas, that Javon Jesse from Hyderabad, India is with us and have made comments. Uh, the Higgins from uh, Vider, Texas are here. So we have uh, South Texas and West Texas. Uh, and then we have further West Texas with uh, brother Denny Wilson uh, joining us today. And we so appreciate uh, all of our fellow Bible students that join us. And so let's see here. We've got just a few things that uh, uh, we do want to uh, make note of. If you're with us today and you make a comment, uh, let us know that you are here. I always like to uh, point out where our Bible students are from. I know that we have several listeners that may not necessarily want to be uh, chimed up on the radio or on Facebook Live, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, you're welcome to join us in any fashion that you so choose. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, today is Open Mic Friday. And so that means that we're discussing questions related to this biblical doctrine. And so questions such as, what is truth? Uh, is truth absolute or fluid? Uh, is truth objective or uh, subjective? Uh, is truth knowable or is it elusive? Uh, what is the nature of truth. And uh, after our song today, uh, we're going to uh, consider uh, some uh, vital uh, Bible information regarding that. Uh, uh, Brother Steve Harrington is, uh, Hetherington is here with us. We appreciate uh, you joining us, brother, and uh, we hope that others will be able to join us uh, live and uh, join, by the way, join in on the conversation. I realize that it might appear that I stop in the middle of a thought, and uh, but that's really what you do in a Bible study. Uh, you may be uh, uh, presenting something, and somebody raises their hand in the back and say, uh, or they make a comment, and uh, or you see the faces of certain individuals, and so you feel as if 
uh, as a teacher, you need to readjust or you need to answer the question. Or I have a little box uh, that I put uh, some questions in because uh, they're good questions. They need to be answered. But at the same time, I want to continue the flow of the thought. So I put them in that box over there. And uh, the brethren here uh, know that uh, certain questions uh, go in that box and we'll get to them later. And then again, I might give you a quick answer, but still put it in the box because I want to address it uh, in a more thorough fashion. Some of the questions that we've had here, uh, in fact, are questions that have been important enough, I thought, for a entire study in and of itself. And what so what I'm saying is don't feel uh, as if you have to remain silent uh, during this Bible study. Uh, this is a Bible study. And so if you have a question and I and I see it, sometimes as a teacher, you don't see somebody. And uh, so uh, if I see it, I'm going to uh, address it in one form or another. And so because I, I appreciate all of our fellow Bible students and, and uh, I learn a great deal by having an opportunity to be able to study the Bible with you. And that's always something that is, is uh, it's valuable to me as a Christian. It's valuable to me as a gospel preacher to be able to learn from others and to be able to, you know, sometimes when you're talking about a subject matter, you haven't even given any thought to something that is obvious to somebody else. And so that is the importance of our Bible study. And for all of those congregations and all of those Christians that are out there uh, that have not been able to engage in a collective Bible study with their local congregation, not talking about worship, that's a different issue, but not, in, not being able to engage in Bible study, I do want to suggest to you uh, that uh, uh, that is such an important element in the growth and stability of a congregation that as soon as possible, we need to get back uh, to that. And uh, so with that encouragement, I want us now to enjoy, well, not just enjoy, my friends, but uh, I love, as you know, I love to sing along with these psalms. These are psalms hymns and spiritual songs, and they are designed not just for the purpose of listening to, but they are designed for the purpose of sharing our voices together. Now, I cannot hear yours, but you can hear mine, and that may be unfortunate for you. I don't know, but I love this song. I appreciate it. I, I, it's one of my greatest so, uh, 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 encouraging songs that uh, I enjoy. So, uh, uh, welcome to uh, Walking on Heaven's Road. Walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load. Sinner, me your burden down. You're walking on Heaven's Road, and when you're walking on Heaven's Road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said He'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Ain't no people crying there. Ain't no goodness anywhere. Ain't no need to shed a tear. You're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he walked along with, with me. Praise, praise God, God. Oh, holy hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Young folks walking in hand in hand, hand singing with the angel man. Old folks ain't so tired and worn. We're walking on heaven's road. And when you're Walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. 
Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? All right, my friends, what a wonderful opportunity that we've had to... Uh, be able to uh, glean from and be encouraged by that beautiful song. So I want to get right to our topic today. And in order to do so, uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, thoughts that we need to uh, consider uh, when we are talking about the truth. And really the first question that we need to consider is that of what is truth? If we're going to talk about a subject, then we need to have a concept of what it is that we are actually talking about. You know, if you ask anybody today, uh, what is truth? Uh, you're sure to start a very interesting conversation with people. Uh, try it on a university campus, and you're likely to receive laughter, scorn, derision, maybe even, in regards to that. But the concept of truth is vitally important, and there is no doubt that it has fallen upon hard times, my friends. The consequences, though, of rejecting this uh, is uh, seen in the uh, uh, ravaging of our society today. Uh, there are so many things that we could point to and say that is directly related to the failure of our society to accept the Bible definition of truth. And so it has fallen upon hard times, and uh, it is ravaging our society. So we do need to go back to uh, the opening question that we started this week with, and that is, what is truth? Now for that, there, there are many definitions that you could go to, and uh, I want to start with the world's definition of truth. And uh, for that, I want to turn our attention uh, to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, just to show you how other people view truth. And I've got it pulled up here on my computer. Truth is one of the central subjects in philosophy. It is also one of the largest. Truth has been a topic of discussion in its own right for thousands of years. Moreover, a huge variety of issues in philosophy relate to truth, either by re relying on these theses about truth or implying theses about uh, truth. It would be impossible to serve, survey all there is to say about truth in a coherent way. Instead, this essay will concentrate on the main themes in the study of truth in the contemporary philosophical literature. Now, he goes on to say uh, that uh, there are many different ways, but he says the problem of truth is easy to state. What truths are and what, if anything, makes them true. But the simple statement ma masked a great deal of controversy, he says. Whether there be uh, any metaphysical problem of truth at all, and if there is, what kind of theory uh, might address it? And so there are all kinds of theories that are out there. You can see that even in the definition of what truth is, that a lot of people just simply cannot define what truth is. In, in fact, and, and we'll discuss this a little bit more when we talk about some things in regards to the absolute nature of truth, but that's really that really serves as the core problem that we have with regards uh, to truth is the fact that most people really cannot even define what truth is. And uh, so one of the most profound and eternally significant questions is this first question, what is truth? Pilate, you, remain, you remember, uh, not even a Christian, 
uh, handed Jesus over to the uh, uh, people to crucify him, turned to Jesus in that final hour and would ask, what is truth? Now, it's my personal opinion and my belief that that is not a, uh, uh, he was not seeking to come to an understanding of truth. He did not want Jesus to answer the question that it was a rhetorical question, that it was a cynical response to what Jesus had already stated, that he had come into the world to reveal or to testify to the truth. And uh, uh, Brother Stephen says, I like the correspondence theory of truth because truth is that which corresponds to reality. And uh, so truth is not itself reality, but is the statement or proposition uh, that accurately describes or corresponds to reality. That seems to me to be, and I'm going to uh, finish up here, that seems to me to be a great way to sum it up. I think what we will find, uh, Brother Harrington, is, uh, 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 is that that is exactly what the Bible presents. Uh, is that truth is that which corresponds to reality. Now, the problem that we have is how do we determine what corresponds with reality? And that is where, right, the rubber meets the road in our discussion. And uh, so uh, uh, it is an excellent uh, point that you bring up as far as a philosophical discussion of truth. And so here is Pilate. Pilate did, a lot of people ask questions, you understand, that they really don't want the answer to in the first place. It's not the reason why they're asking the question. Uh, sometimes people ask a question in order to end a conversation rather than uh, to open up a conversation. And in fact, that's what Pilate is doing here, I believe, and uh, that he is, uh, uh, he is simply suggesting that he doesn't uh, recognize the value of truth. So to some, truth is subjective, it's individual, uh, and uh, it's all about my opinion, my, my feelings, my beliefs, my, uh, my uh uh, my narrative of life is how they would uh, often refer to it. My experiences and things such as that, uh, my collective uh, 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 experiences put together, then I arrive at the truth. So truth to them is subjective rather than objective in nature. And so when we talk about what is truth, truth uh, if we just put together a simple definition, and I like the one that Brother Steve uh, Stephen put together there, uh, or, or showed, or demonstrated to us, but but here's what I want to suggest to you: uh, uh, any definition of the true reality of the way things are, things that correspond uh, to reality, are things which must be derived from the Bible perspective. In fact, if you take the Bible out of this discussion, you cannot have a true, thorough discussion of this topic at all. So truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, and glory, and the very essence and being of God. He is that which corresponds to reality. He is reality. And uh, uh, so when we talk about the truth, then we're talking about that which corresponds to the will of God. Truth is the self-expression of God himself and his mind for us. That is true reality for us. Who are we? Where did we come from? What are we doing here? What is our role? What is our function here? What is our uh, ultimate uh, objective and end? Uh, how shall we live? What kind of parent should I be? What kind of civilian uh, should I be or citizen should I be? What kind of, uh, uh, what kind of husband or wife or, or uh, whatever? What, what, all of that reality 
is determined by God himself. And so truth is the self-expression of God. It is, the, it is God's expression of his will, and his will always is the truth. And uh, so it is important that we understand, and this, this is where uh, the rubber meets the road as far as uh, the distinction between a Christian and uh, the worldview of those individuals that are not Christians is what is truth, what is the source of truth, and uh, how we define that is uh, in reality so much different from one another that sometimes it makes us it makes it hard to communicate because we're using the same words oftentimes, but we're not using the same definitions. And that, again, uh, is important. Good to have uh, Sister Ferris uh, join us as well. We're grateful uh, for you uh, having the ability to be with us uh, today. We're discussing this concept of truth. You know, the Old Testament, as we've already mentioned in the beginning of our study, uh, refers to God as the God of truth. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 4 was the passage we utilize, but there are many others. Psalms and Isaiah in particular talk about and utilize this very statement that God is truth. Jesus himself said, remember in John 14, 6, I am the truth. He was actually saying that uh, this is a claim that he is making of deity. He is not just saying, I know some of the truth. He is saying, I am the source of truth. And uh, seeing then that he came to reveal God, John 1 and four, uh, 14 and John 1 and 18, and seeing that he is the brightness of uh, the glory of God and the express image of his person, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, no wonder then the Bible would say there, God, who at sunder times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he created the world. And so he is truth incarnate. And we've already discussed this concept of incarnate, in sarke, in the flesh. He is the, and, and I almost hate to say it this way, he is the perfect expression of God in the flesh, but it's even more than that. He is God in the flesh, and so he is that reality uh, that uh, Brother Stephen was talking about earlier in regards to the expression of the, uh, the reality of a situation. Uh, that is one of the reasons, by the way, that I have suggested over and over again that when something comes out in the news cycle, when something comes out, especially you see it on Facebook, I, I, I am oftentimes appalled by my brethren and by society who want to jump right in without knowing the facts. Now, it's one thing uh, to be ignorant of the facts, but you don't speak out of ignorance. You wait for the evidence to unfold. And evidence means that there has to be inquiry, Deuteronomy 17. There has to be a, an injunction, uh, an, an injunction, a, a discovery method. And uh, that discovery method oftentimes takes time. And uh, so I have to be willing and patient in regards to the truth. And uh, so that becomes very important. You know, Jesus also said that the Word of God, that which is written and spoken as the Word of God, uh, you, you listen, it doesn't contain nuggets of truth uh, that would uh, invalidate uh, the uh, veracity of the Bible, but it is the truth. And uh, that truth, according to Jesus, cannot be broken, John 10 and verse number 35. You remember as he was praying to uh, the Father, he would say of his disciples, he said, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. 
John 17 and 17, and we know that the Word of God is eternal truth, that it lives and abides forever, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 23. Uh, let's see here, got some uh, comments, uh, so I guess you can tie the correspondence theory back uh, to God. Reality ultimately is an overflow or an outflow from God. He is the foundation of reality. So in that sense, truth ultimately is tracked to the ultimate reality, God himself. Uh, 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 good lesson so far. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about in, in regards to this. And that's why we want to tie all of these things together. Now, uh, it is vitally important that we understand some these fundamentals in regards uh, to this. So, let's see if we can progress in our study uh, to also include, because I believe this is as valuable in everyday, uh, what we would call practical truth, that is, uh, let's say, the reality of whether or not uh, those police officers in Minneapolis acted incorrectly, negligently, or was it homo uh, uh, a homicide? Uh, and and at what degree is that? So, uh, and I, I'm not getting into that discussion, uh, except to say, what is the reality of that? Now, I myself may never come to the complete reality of that. Now, that is not to suggest that someone cannot know the truth in that, I'm just saying I don't have all of the facts. I have a certain limited um, ability at this time to understand facts. So as such, I have to be limited in my response. That's the patient aspect of that. But my friends, we have to, and I think this gets to the heart of the matter here, we have to love truth for truth's sake. And I don't care if you're an atheist. I don't care if uh, we vehemently disagree on the issue at hand in Minneapolis or any other issue. If you and I do not possess a love for truth, just for truth's sake, then it will be hard for us to arrive at the truth. Uh, in fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, because there was not a love for the truth, they suffered a strong delusion and were lost. It was based upon their fault, not God's ability now uh, to uh, distribute truth. It was related to their, in, their unlove, the, the fact that they did not love the truth. And so men must first, and that's why I want to address this at the very beginning, men must first love the truth for truth's sake. It has to be valuable to us. Thus, this is why we uh, discussed earlier in the week uh, in Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Why? Because it is that valuable. Contend earnestly for the truth, as we spoke of yesterday in Jude 3. Why? Because it is worthy of our protection. It is something that is valuable in this. And uh, Brother Javon brings up John 8 and 31. Uh, the truth shall make us free. Freedom is associated. Freedom from the bondage of sin, in particular, uh, is what is being spoken. You know, what's interesting. I hear that verse associated with everything under the sun except for sin. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Well, it, Javon is right. It will set you free. Uh, and it'll set you free from a lot of things. But Jesus is talking about the bondage of sin in regards to that. And sin, sin is a transgression of the law of God. Uh, it, is, uh, it is adding to, subtracting from, uh, uh, going beyond all that, there's a lot of development in regards to sin, it's selfishness, and, uh, but at the heart of all of that is the fact that the truth will set us free. And uh, so uh, it is important that we love it for uh, just itself. 
I, I'm listen. If we are not a truth seeker in all things, I really find it difficult then that we could be a truth seeker in anything. In other words, if my motives and my uh, my selfishness is going to get in the way of arriving at any particular truth, and I'm not willing to give that up, then it will get in the way of anything that I come in contact with. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse number 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, I do understand that the context to a large extent is dealing with the nature and the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit uh, among the apostles in the first century. But it is still true that fellowship, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and uh, uh, that it cannot be had without a love for the truth. And uh, so it is important that we have this discussion of what is truth. Now, another question in association with our discussion this week that is often asked, and I find that many of uh, my Bible students over the years have asked this question here, uh, is truth absolute or is it fluid? You know, fluid in our society is something that is generally asked in relationship uh, to gender. Uh, but it is something that needs to be under, and by the way, that's because there is no standard of truth in the heart and minds of those individuals who accept gender fluidity. So gender fluidity is when gender identity shifts between masculine and feminine. That is when I personally believe that sometimes I am feminine, and sometimes I am masculine. That's how that's how the world views. Uh, see, it's it's not in relationship to reality. It is a relationship to feelings, and feelings are not reality. I may feel that you are snubbing me, and in fact, uh, in reality, you have only been busy and not. Uh, uh, and uh, you were behind and needed to get to something else. You did not snub me. That was not the purpose of you uh, avoiding me or going in a different direction. It was just that there was another item that was more pressing at the time. Now, my feelings may be hurt, and I may say I'm offended. It's not an offense, but I may say that because that's the way I feel, but that's not in association with reality. And the same is true with regards to the gender issue. So here's how this would pl play out as far as absolute or fluid, uh, uh, the nature of truth. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at some definitions here uh, from the world in regards to this discussion so that we can uh, better prepare ourselves. So they would say uh, that uh, uh, gender identity is fluid, and here's how they would spell it out. Non-binary. Now, I want to pause there. I'll get back to that word, non-binary, because I think that is important. Non-binary, uh, or gender queer is how it's referred, is a spectrum of gender identities that are not exclusively masculine or feminine. It identifies that uh, that they are outside the gender binary. All right, so uh, we're going to have to have some kind of definition, right, and understanding. If we're going to truly appreciate and value this discussion, then we have to know what it is they're saying. So they would say non-binary gender describes any gender identity which does not fit into the male-female binary spectrum. Those with non-binary genders can feel that they have both masculine and feminine gender identities uh, and uh, uh, have an identity between male and female such as inner intergender is the way they would refer to it. So I'm thinking, okay, if we're going to truly understand this, I think we understand binary in our computer uh, society, but 
sometimes when it's used out of its initial context, we might say, wait a minute, what are they really saying? Well, binary is something that by definition refers to the inclusion of two items, right? It's X's and O's in uh, a computer language. A binary system uh, is something that has uh, having two parts to it. By two, not try three, or uno one, right? It is a binary. Uh, so what they're saying is then that gender fluidity means not only it's non-binary. That is, it, it, when you when you it's it's uh, positive and negative, right? It, it's uh, the male and female connectors uh, uh, in regards to electricity or anything else. Uh, it is they're binary things. You have a positive and a negative on your battery, and uh, uh, those and you don't cross uh, the positive and the negative without a great deal of difficulty, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about uh, non-binary. And so, what I'm suggesting uh, to you is their definition and their description of items demonstrate that they believe that truth, the reality, that which corresponds to reality. Uh, that that is not absolute, but that it is uh, fluid in nature. But now, what do we really mean when we talk about truth being absolute? By absolute, we mean that it is final and unchangeable. That is an absolute truth. We mean that it is full in every stated intent. Therefore, it is incapable of addition, subtraction, any change, or alteration without any form unless there is a perversion to it. So when we say that the Bible is absolute, that's what we are saying. When we talk about truth being absolute, then we're talking about the fact that it cannot be fluid in nature, you see. Now there may be a lot of things that are fluid in nature but truth is not one of them. And uh, so because the Word of God, the expression of the will of God, is absolute, the meaning that it had when it was originally spoken and originally written, regardless of how long ago that occurred, is still the meaning of it today. That is what we're talking about when we talk about the nature of truth. Uh, now, with that in mind, it should be emphasized that because Scripture is absolute, that exegesis is the only way uh, to arrive at the truth of Scripture. It is the only standard of exegesis, uh, of interpretation, I should say. Exegesis. Now, what are we saying there? Let me just give you a further definition so that we understand what we're talking about. Uh, the ideal of exegesis is drawing out of a passage that which is actually there. Eisegesis is putting into the passage what I want. When I read in what I want, then that is called eisegesis. When I draw out what God actually put there, then it's called exegesis. Now, generally speaking, and, and this is a hermeneutical discussion uh, later on as well, we can deal further with this if we need to, but generally speaking, when we talk about exegesis, we're talking about historical literary exegesis, that which is what does the text say, and there could be some historical elements there that need to be considered. And uh, so the historical literary exegesis of what we're talking about. The reason why we say this and the reason why we engage in this is because of, say, passages such as Psalm 119 and verse number 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is established in heaven. There is an absolute uh, nature to the truth of God and his word. Psalm 119, I want you to notice with me verse 160. The King James says, thy word is true from the beginning. That is, 
what it is saying is that the sum total of God's word is truth. That is, only when I have the totality of what God said on the subject do I have absolute truth. Now that is vitally important because if I read one scripture and I don't include another scripture, I do not have all the truth on the subject. And that, my friends, is the problem that many people uh, have in their hermeneutics or in their interpretation, Bible interpretation. They do not consider all that God has said on the subject before drawing the conclusion that is warranted by the statement. Some of the old timers would talk about necessary inference. That is, I infer something that is absolutely essential from necessary from my reading of God's word. Uh, some others would use the word implication because the author implies and the uh, student infers. And so implication may be the stronger word that is used in that particular case. But all of this is only important if truth is absolute. See, if truth is not absolute, if it is fluid, then uh, we might as well, anybody's, uh, by the way, how many times have you heard people say that, well, that's the way you uh, accept it. That's the way you believe. Uh, that's the way that tradition uh, approaches this. Uh, well, that suggests then that I do not believe in the absolute nature of truth. And uh, so another question that is related to this is, uh, uh, is truth objective or subjective? Now, by objective, we mean that it's outside of myself. <clears throat> by subjective, I mean that it is determined by me, that I am the, I am the, uh, funnel, you might say, uh, in regards to what truth is. But God's truth is never determined by man's feelings. Again, I may feel something about something, but that does not deter. In fact, might I suggest this? Sometimes our feelings about a matter hinder us from a proper understanding of the truth of a situation. And this, this is very dangerous in regards to that. Oh, good to have the, the Hoxtras here with us uh, uh, today and uh, all the way from uh, way up yonder in Michigan land. And so good to have y'all. Y'all probably been with us for a while, but it's good to have y'all. just saw uh, that notation. Uh, Brother Stephen says, uh, a judge jury must consider all the evidence that has been presented before it reaches a verdict. You know, that's uh, an interesting analogy. I've actually served on two uh, juries. Uh, one is a a foreman, and then the other as uh, a member of the jury, and maybe y'all have as well. Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, you want to make sure you get all, especially when someone's life is in, is or their livelihood or or uh, a, a, a jail time. All of those things are uh, man. All of those things are very uh, difficult. Uh, to determine. And you want to make sure you have it right. And you want to make sure you're not misunderstanding something. Is not the Bible and the handling of truth then, and, and is this not re the reason why individuals are sworn in? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Well, certainly that is uh, uh, good for us uh, to be here in regards to uh, to that and to understand the nature of truth. And so it's not about my feelings. I, I may, I may uh, feel a certain way, but I have to get rid of that feeling, set that aside. Not the easiest thing, but a necessary thing in order to understand the truth. Now, by the way, regardless of the sincerity of a person, Yes, I like what James says in the chat, TGRN chat window. He says, people say, that's your truth, not mine. No, if it is truth, it is true. And so, and what, we're, what we really talk about there, what we're really trying to, I think a lot of people say is, 
uh, I'm sincere in my belief, you're sincere in your belief. And so it, but it's not about sincerity here. Now, is sincerity important to understanding the truth? Certainly, it is commendable, it is necessary of a student to possess, but let me suggest this to you. Sincerity alone produces no understanding. Think about that just for a second. Sincerity alone produces no understanding. It, it, it will not allow, it, there's, there's nothing that sincerity is something that is vital and important. Remember the motivation that we had in the beginning to love the truth for truth's sake. That is certainly a sincere motive, but just the motive itself doesn't arrive at anything. A lot of sincere individuals have arrived at the wrong understanding of a situation. Uh, sometimes we have juries that come out and a person was actually innocent and was proclaimed guilty and sent to prison. Years later, it is, and the jury member said, if we would have had that information, we would not have made that decision, right? They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. Because, listen, bad input, and we've seen this with regards to the coronavirus hysteria, bad input gets you a bad outcome, right? It, it, the, they're, they're all saying the models that we predicted this or that on, we put in bad input. So if you have bad input, then you're going to get a bad outcome. And so it is sincerity is important, but sincerity proves nothing in regards to the nature of truth. Truth doesn't change with the experiences of men either. Experiences may cause one to have different feelings and different viewpoints, but the truth is objective and in no way changes based upon those feelings or based upon those experiences or based upon my viewpoints. Because all of those things are subjective in nature. And uh, being uh, subjective, listen, Proverbs 14 and verse number 12 states this very basic principle uh, that, uh, well, and it just... Uh, 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 it just blew my mind. You know, you can have the simple, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the way thereunto uh, is, are the ways of death. Now think about that. He's dealing with sincerity's relationship to the truth and that it cannot determine uh, what truth is. It has no, no value in regards to the arrival at whether or not something is true or not. Now, whether or not I accept it, whether or not I value it as true, that's where the model of sincerity comes in. So because the truth is uh, uh, so objective instead of subjective, uh, then there are some people who, because they're unwilling to accept it, then their sincerity uh, does come under question if they understand something uh, as the truth, right? So it is important. I, people say, as, as Brother Clark mentioned, uh, people say, well, that's your truth. This is my truth, right? Or I, I don't see it that way. Or uh, they might even say, uh, uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, that's just yours, and, and this is mine, as he mentioned earlier. But John 12 and 48 says that we will be judged by the truth. I'm not going to be judged. By the way, if I'm judged by my truth, who will not pass the test? If the student is allowed to determine the definition of all things, if the student is allowed to determine what something means, thus the reality of truth, Will they not all pass the test? Certainly they will. Uh, you could say, what year uh, did Columbus discover America? In 1642. Uh, and that's the answer. And somebody's, well, I'm, 
listen, I, it's my understanding that it's closer uh, to 12, uh, 15. I put that down and say, well, what I meant by that, 12, 15 actually means 1432 or whatever the date is. And, and uh, so uh, that's my reality. That's my truth. We wouldn't say that there. A teacher would not allow that in any way. And so truth then uh, must be objective and not subjective. Well, the other question that we had uh, uh, for us uh, today was in regards to, is it knowable? Is the truth knowable uh, in, in regards uh, to these items? Uh, so is truth knowable? Uh, think about the relationship of truth. Uh, well, as uh, our good brother Javon Jesse has already mentioned, uh, that truth cannot be elusive because our salvation depends upon it, right? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Paul declares that his understanding of the truth as he writes it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, can be understood by those individuals that read it. Uh, 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 Brother Denny puts in there, says, uh, what does this passage mean to you? Yes, that's it. Uh, well, it means to me, no, it means, always means what the author meant it to say, uh, not what we think, we feel, we want, we wish it to mean. Uh, in, in fact, the, the reason why you ask that question as a teacher, the only reason why you should ask that kind of question is to gather their understanding of a text, right? Uh, you, you, you are not, you are not uh, ascertaining the truth. What does that passage mean to you? Well, it means this to me. It means this to me. No, 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 no. That's not the truth of the situation, and that's not how we arrive at it. That's to arrive at the student's understanding of how to develop truth or how to understand truth. And so Denny makes an excellent point. We have taken valuable things, and because of our misunderstanding of things, we have turned them topsy-turvy, we might say. We've turned them on their heads. And uh, so, and Denny brings up an excellent point in regards to that. Now think about this as we, and we, we, we do have to close our lesson here pretty soon. We're just simply running out of time. But Paul declared that he knew whom he believed in. 2 Timothy 1.12, right? In the context, he exhorts Timothy to hold fast the form or the pattern of sound words which he heard of him. Later, he would say in 2 Timothy 2.15 that he is to rightly divide the truth. Now, none of these actions, none of these actions can be done if the word of truth is unless the word of truth is understood, right? And so this is where you get into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, right? People are ever learning, never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, verse number 7. Why? Because they had a false perspective of things, and their motive was wrong. Uh, Brother Sean uh, Payton, good to have you today. Truth is reality, and uh, uh, and as such, it must all it, it can be knowable. As such, it it is uh, objective in its nature, and it is absolute in its nature. Now, we're not talking about what I know about the truth. We're talking about the truth itself. My knowledge of a situation may change based upon the information that I get. But the information was reality before I learned it. And this is why I suggest to people that it is vitally important that we handle the Word of God correctly. That's why Bible study is so important. That's why the laws of logic 
of sound reasoning. God said, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Produce your cause. In other words, put forth your strong reasoning and see if they match up with reality. See if they match up with the truth or not. Now, my friends, this has been, uh, for me, a very valuable study. I hope that it has been for you. Uh, but as all good things here and now, with time as our enemy, uh, we have arrived at the end of our Bible lesson today. And I'm so thankful that you've not only joined me, but that you have uh, participated with me in this wonderful Bible study. May God bless you and may you have a wonderful, wonderful a uh, day.